It's in my vein, Lord, it's in my veins, down in my veins, the Lord, it's in my veins, and while the blood, while the blood is running warm, down in my veins, way down in my, way down in my vein, Lord, it's in my veins, down in my veins, Lord, it's in my, while the blood is, while the blood is running warm, down in my veins, way down in my veins. I want to say good morning to, to each of you that I have not had an opportunity to speak to. We're going to be studying from 1 Kings chapter 19, so you may want to uh, turn to 1 Kings 19 in your... In your Bibles. I'm going to uh, ask, there's a brother who, who has the mic that's going to, that's going to, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to get some volunteer readers. I'd like to have someone to read uh, three verses of 1 Kings 19. Verses 1, 2, and 3, and then somebody else read 4, 5, and 6, and then somebody else read 7 and 8, and it doesn't matter which translation you have. So who want to be the first volunteer reader? They're going to give you, a, give you a mic. I want this to be an interactive class. That's what I think you're accustomed to. And uh, I... Uh, I'm going to, um, so first three verses, First Kings chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with her how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by, to, by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Verse 4, Verse four five and 6, somebody. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Right. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. All right. Verse 7 and 8, someone. Verse, verse 7 and 8. He's going to bring your mic. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went, into, and went in the strength of that meat 40, 40 days and forty nights unto Horeb. My eyes are bad, y'all. The, the, the mount, mount of God. All right. Thank you very much. That is First Kings chapter nineteen, verses one through eight. This is the story of Elijah, and uh, I am sure most of us are familiar. Have heard an awful lot of teaching across the years on First Kings. 19 verses 
1 through 8, I want to discuss situational stress from this topic. Believe it or not, stress and depression is a Bible subject. Uh, I would like to ask you, when you hear the term stress, what do you think about? So if you'll raise your hand, I'll repeat what you say so that it can be on the tape. But what do you think about when you hear the word stress? When you hear stress, what do you think about? Yeah. This is not a right or a wrong. This is just an insight. Yes, my children. I think about my children. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Job. Think about, okay, children, job. What do you think about when you hear stress? Trouble, all right, give me another hand. Yes, sir. Think about bills. Yes, sir. The health, health issues. School. School. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Extreme pressure. Extreme pressure. Yes, ma'am. Emotional weight. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Anxiety and mental health, because if it gets out of control, it definitely destroys your health. Anybody else? All right. What is interesting about stress is that it's a reality. We all have to deal with it. We don't, we don't have the legal definitions always for it, but we know it when we see it because you just described it. So why do you think we ought to be having this conversation even at church? Yes, ma'am. Recently, there's been an increase in uh, suicides um, in the world. And I think it comes from people not understanding that there is hope because stress becomes so heightened. It becomes, there is no hope that they can't get out of this situation. Yeah. I heard somebody say emotional weight. So when the weight gets too heavy and you feel like you can't carry it anymore, you just give up. So it starts with depression. And depression, if it's not dealt with, leads to that sense of hopelessness. And you find yourself thinking, I'm better off at another place. Anybody else? Why you think we ought to be having this discussion in church? because it affects the, all of us in some way and some of us more than others. And how can we be the people of God? How can we be the children of God and not be concerned about the hurts, the habits, and the hangups that the rest of us have to deal with? So I wanna, I wanna see, I'm gonna have to get used to this. So do I have to point this back up here? Can I stand? It's not moving for me. So is that going to help? Now we're in trouble. So why is it, why? See, that's the thing about, I tell you what, I'm not going to have any stress behind this. <laughs> they, they are going to get it fixed. Oh, there you go. All right, so I'm going to, so maybe he's going to have to run it for me upstairs. Move to the next slide, whoever, because somehow the remote is not working. I don't know whether the battery, okay. Stress in psychology and medicine was borrowed from physics and uh, engineering, where it meant the application of sufficient force to an object or system to distort or to deform it. So we talk about like a rubber band, when you pull a rubber band, it has stress. That's where the whole idea of stress came from. And if you keep pulling on the rubber band, and if the stress level gets too tense, what happens? 
the rubber band snaps. And our nervous system, our emotional system, operates pretty much the same way. Stress is good, but too much stress without the relaxation will allow you to snap. That's why you hear people talk about people having a what? A nervous what? There's the snap, all right? Move to my next slide. All right, here is the legal definition of stress. So you may want to write this down for yourself. We're not going to finish all of this, but uh, Brother Wood's going to have the uh, lesson and we can continue this at, a, at another time. I'm going to get as much done as I can. Stress is a perception of threat or expectation of future discomfort that arouses. It alerts or otherwise activates either an emotional or physiological response. In other words, when you perceive a threat, the next slide is gonna, gonna break that down. That's the, that's the legal definition for stress. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the Lane's definition. Next slide. Stress is the gap between the demands placed on us and the strength we have for meeting the demands. Does that sound, does that sound like something you can hang on to? Okay, stress means that there are situations that come and it becomes stressful when the demands are greater than the strength we have to meet the demands. So what is important is stress is when you per, your perceived demands, because see, a lot of things that you see as demands are really not demands, you perceive them as demands. Just like, okay, uh, it's, it's, it's been a while since I've done PowerPoint here and I did not realize when I walked up here that there's not a monitor in this back that I can see what you see behind me. And I should have checked that out before I started teaching and had I done that I would have done something slightly different. So, so when you are a, a younger inexperienced teacher and you have your mind locked on how you gonna do what you're doing, and you walk in and it's totally different, what's the first thing you do? You panic. Like, okay, now what am I gonna do? So I have this plan A, B, and C, and A and B did not work. <laughs> so I'm at C. So the perceived is like, I, I came in with my mind, I expected something, it didn't work out, so I didn't have a plan B or C. That's when I panic. Does that sound like most of our situations? This is why this is called situational stress. Because almost any situation that you don't expect to turn up and you are so used to not having an alternative plan for things that not work. You know the best way to avoid stress? is anticipated. Oh my God. See, if you anticipate it, you already have in your arsenal some things to do just in case it doesn't work out. So, so the men uh, that, that, you know, the leadership and any, anybody who worked with me for any length of time, you hear me talk over and over about a plan A a B and a C because plan A very seldom works out the way you want to and most of us we spend all of our time with plan A that we don't think about plan B so when plan A doesn't work then we are under stress in the moment trying to figure it out when if you would do some anticipation for things going wrong up front it will release some of the stress. All right. 
Let's move to the, to the next slide. Uh, so here we are in 1 Kings 19. So now let's take what we just learned from, from, for, from, uh, from the psychology book on stress and let's apply it to what we see in this text. I've already said to you that uh, as you gave to me, and you're going to see where I, why I wanted you to, to give me what stress looks like. There is a progression involved. Now what you see on the screen when we talk about Elijah presupposes that you've already accepted a reality. God made us as human beings slightly different from everything else that he's ever made. He made us three-dimensional. He made us body. What, 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 what's the other? What, what are the other two dimensions? Body, soul, and spirit. All so those three dimensions. Now I'm going to break that down. Body, soul, and spirit. We have three dimensions. When we talk about body, we're talking about the temple. Over and over, you know what a temple is? It's a dwelling place. So when the Bible talks about a temple, there is that concept that the temple was the place where God dwelled. Because a temple is literally a dwelling place. So the temple is where you live. Your body is called a temple. <clears throat> I, think that's, I think that's in the Bible somewhere, isn't it? No, you're not. Where's that, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20? No, you're not. That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he says, your body is a temple. So you need to take care of this body because this body is where you live. Okay? Say that again, Brother Minister. That just went through right over my head. He said, take care of this body because this body is where you live. Because the you that makes you you is not what you see. When you look at me, you're only seeing what my body. That's why you can't judge me. You don't know me well enough to judge me. You don't see enough of me. All you see is where I live. The only one that can see the me that makes me me is God. Isn't that why 1 Samuel said, man looketh what? Up on the outward appearance, but God looks where? The at the heart. You know why he said God looks at the heart? Because the you that makes you you is your heart. And your spiritual heart is synonymous with your soul. Your soul is your spiritual heart. You have a physical heart and you have a spiritual heart. And just like your physical heart has four chambers, your spiritual heart does also. So your spiritual heart or your soul has four chambers. The mind, the will, the conscience, and the emotions. That's who you are. You are a combination of a mind, and with your mind, you think, you reason, and you understand. So what you do with your mind, you think, you reason, you understand. That's why you have passages uh, like whatsoever man thinketh in his heart, so is he. 
Mark chapter 2 verse 9. Why reason you these things in your heart? It's dealing with your mind. Your will is the seat of volition. Your will is where you make decisions, where you make your choices. So you will read passages like Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Daniel will purposed in his heart. Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat. He willed. He purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat. So with the mind, you think, you reason, you understand, you believe. With the will, you choose and you refuse. Then there's the conscience. The conscience registers your likes and your dislikes. It warns and it forewarns. It, it warns and your forewarns. In other words, my conscience has to be taught. The, you teach your conscience what is right and what is wrong, and it warns you. So if your conscience is wired wrong, it warns you wrong. But your conscience is the part of your being that warns you of the violation of your moral and your ethical values. Acts chapter 2. And when they heard this, Acts 2, 36, and when they heard this, they were pricked where? In their hearts. What part of the heart was pricked? The conscience. See how that works? Mind, will, conscience, and then that last component of your spiritual heart is called emotions. Your emotions registers your likes and your dislikes. Name an emotion, somebody. Give me a hand. Name an emotion. Happiness. Name an emotion. Give me a hand so we won't all speak at the same time. Give me a hand. Yes, sir. Sadness. Give me an emotion. Anger. Give me an emotion. Fear. Give me an emotion. Joy. Give me an emotion. Spirit. Okay. Which he's going to use spirit as joy. Okay. Depression. Depression. Okay. Pleasure. Love. Okay. These are emotions. Now, now get this. Body, soul, and spirit. So when we hear the word body, we talk about our temple. When we hear the word soul, we're talking about our spiritual heart. The you that makes you you. And when we hear the word spirit, we're talking about breath or life, pneuma. It has to do with breath, that, the word pneuma. Is the same where we get pneumonia from in English, and it has to do with your breathing. So when the Bible talks about spirit, it's talking about breath, life. In other words, he's dealing with what is considered to be a different quality of life. So everything God made. He made two-dimensional except man. Now here's your wow for Bible class. We are three-dimensional. We have what? A body, a soul, and a spirit. So technically, hear this. You are a soul. that has a spirit that lives in a body. That's who you are. You are a soul that has a spirit that lives in a body. Every other being, everything else that has life has two dimensions. We have three because we are made in the image of God. 
Okay. Plants are two-dimensional. Plants have a body and a spirit. No soul. An animal is two-dimensional. A dog has a body and a spirit. No soul. The only other thing that's alive are angels. Angels have a soul and a spirit and know what? There you go. So the only thing that has all three is man. So in order for man, I see your hand. I see your hand. I, I haven't forgotten. So, the, so, so what's important about the all three is that the body, the soul, and the spirit are only healthy when they're in harmony with their creator. Oh my God, I, I'm, I'm teaching. I'll mess around and preach if you keep pushing me. Yeah, body, soul, and spirit, or they are healthy when all three are in harmony with their creator. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, yeah. So are you saying the soul is what is given to us when we're born? Or the spirit is it? We have all three when we're born. See, you wouldn't be you. <laughs> So then with the Holy Ghost when we're baptized, when does that right. come? Okay. All right. See, now you jumped into oh, another right. whole nother story. Oh, That's okay. No, now watch this. In order for you to be a human being, you have to have all three. You can't have one. They, they are so tied together, which is my next point, where I'm trying to get to Elisha. They are so tied together that the soul and the spirit, remember now, soul has to do, okay, think of soul as personality. That's what you're used to. You are you, and you as a layman normally think of that as my personality. Well, when you say my personality, you're really saying my, my mind, my will, my conscience, and my emotions. That's what makes you, you, okay? So when you are born as a human being, you are born with all three. You can't separate them and have a human because what makes you human is the combination of all three. Watch this. I'm glad you raised that because you just helped somebody. Now watch this. If I have a body and I don't have a spirit, I don't have no life. Remember when he formed Adam from the beginning? made him in his image he, he had the form but he was dead he blew into his nostrils what? there's that spirit he blew into his nostrils the breath of life and he became what? a living soul so your soul can't be alive without that spirit now what she just did she took us deep when you become a Christian, see, you have life, but you have physical life. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that you may have what? That you may have life and have it more abundantly. Well, he's talking to folk who already were alive. He's talking to folk who are alive, but they are alive physically. He said, I have come that you may have a different kind of life. You, have, you were born and were given physical life. When you obey the gospel, become a Christian, now you get spiritual life. Because God's spirit, see you got a spirit. But what makes you spiritual is God's spirit moves into that temple at the second birth and you have a different kind of life. Did that get where you were trying to go? Does that make sense now? Thank you for asking that question. You just helped a whole lot of folks. Yes, sir. Um, you, you, you mentioned earlier that angels have three parts. No. Oh, two, two. parts. Right. 
I was always under the impression, I'm thinking of Hebrews 13 and 2, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Mm -hmm. I was always under the impression, you can help me out, that we can entertain human beings not realizing that they're angels. Okay, that's figurative language. Figurative language. In other words, a person has the spirit of an angel. You can't be an angel and be a person too. Okay, so, so here's, a, here's, a, here's, a, here's a lesson in hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is interpretation of scripture. When you interpret scripture, there is something called literal and something called figurative. Okay, so let me, let me give you a simple way. This is what, what I use to teach new converts, and this is the easiest way to, to figure this out. When we say something is literal, we mean we read a passage and it makes sense as read. So if you read a passage and it makes sense as read, it is to be taken literally. If you read a passage and it does not make sense as read, it either has a figurative or a symbolic message. That's how you tell the difference between literal and figurative. So when you say uh, you entertain an angel and the angel is a person, doesn't quite jive. How can it be an angel and a person? You can't be both at the same time. So what happened, yes, and, and you, raised, you raised an issue, and maybe sometime we need to study angels. And that, that may be something. And, and, and sometime when I come on one of the trips out here, I'll do a couple of Bible classes on angels. But that's a whole different study. So, so let's say in the sense an angel is a spirit being, is a created spirit being, has no body. So whenever an angel shows up, they, shows up in, they show up in the form of a person because they have no, no body because they are spirit. Technically an angel the word angelos, the word we get angel from, in Greek means messenger. So whenever an angel shows up, he's coming to bring a message. <laughs> so that's as much as we're going to do with the angels. But does that help a little? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, 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 what we're, so what we're saying is angels are two-dimensional. They have a soul, but they don't have a body because they are spirit. Okay, now let me, let me put, go back to my, to my screen and I wanna look at Elijah because I think what I got, how much time do I have? 10 minutes? Yeah, I'm good with this. Well, no, here you take that out. Okay, thank you. All right. Let me, let me take Elijah again and let me show you what you're looking at in, in 1 Kings 19. I say that stress and depression comes when you are physically worn out. Now, I had to do that little dissertation because I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to assume that you are understanding what I mean when I talk about body, soul, and spirit. So now watch. Here's, a, here's another wow that you want to take away with you. The body, the soul, and the spirit live so close to each other that they catch each other's diseases. <laughs> I, as, as Doc would say, I think I just said something. 
the body, the soul, and the spirit live so close to each other that they catch each other's diseases. That's why we are having this discussion in Bible class. Because you are not going to be healthy if you spend all your time working on your soul and neglect your body. Hello, religious folk. We spend all of it and we pride ourselves and oh, you know, I'm a good Christian because I, I spend time in meditation and I spend time with the Lord and I pray and I study and I do soul winning and I do all of that. And then you don't watch what you eat, you never exercise and ain't getting good sleep. Now how spiritual is that when the Lord told you that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You punish the body and, okay. Uh huh. He said, ah, I know. Y'all ain't ready for me this morning. <laughs> All right. So, stress and depression comes when you are physically worn out. So, look at what happens with Elijah. Elijah is running for his life, Jezebel has threatened to kill him. So, he takes off running. And he runs a whole day and he's physically worn out. Stress and depression comes not only when you are physically worn out, you are emotionally wrung out. He's tired. Now his tired body is now talking to his tired soul. He's feeling depressed. Look, Lord, I can't go on. I, I don't know why this has happened to me. You know, I'm the only servant that you got trying to do what's right. I went out there and fought those 450 prophets of Baal and, and I wiped them all out. But Lord, why, why, you know, why, why is this happening to me? I, I, I'm better off, you know. So, so he started talking himself into, see, you better be careful what you say to yourself. That's why you never make important decisions when you are tired. Somebody ought to be able to help me preach this. Because that'll preach on its own. Because when you are tired, you don't think straight. Don't make important decisions when you are tired. So here Elijah is physically worn out and he's emotionally wrung out and his relationship with God paid a penalty for it because now he's spiritually wiped out. That's why this is such a wonderful Bible study. My time is up in about three minutes so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rush ahead. I want to show you something. Uh, stress and depression did two things for Elijah. Go to the next slide. It maximized his foe and minimized his faith. See, when you get tired and worn out, then the devil is going to always take advantage of that. Quickly move to the next slide. And uh, stress have three sources. Stress is going to come from your situation. That includes outside demands of people and things around you. So stress is going to come from your situation. Next slide. He's going to come back and review this because I only have a few minutes and I'm going to close out. Stress will come from, from what? Your situation and the next thing, stress will come from what? What we do to our bodies and what we do for our bodies often determine what our bodies will do for us and what our bodies will do in response to other sources of stress. So in other words, if you're going to be spiritually healthy, you need to take care of this body because when that body gets tired and worn out, it's going to affect your spiritual life as well. Mm. If you can't say amen, just say ouch. Next slide. 
Next slide. I want to get to this last one. Stress will also come from your mind. What we think can trigger stress. Shakespeare said in Hamlet, things are either good, things are neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. He borrowed that from the Bible. As a Proverbs 23, 7, you know that one? As a man what? Thinks in his heart, so is he. You are what you think you are, and you become what you constantly think about. So we think ourselves into depression by talking ourselves into depression, and we have to talk ourselves out of the mess we talk ourselves in. And so here he, Elijah is, as I bid you good morning. Brother Woods is going to come back to this lesson and deal with it a little bit more because this is kind of where we are. When we deal with stress, when we deal with grief, when we deal with all of these things that we don't expect, any crisis in our life can bring about stress. So here Elijah is physically what? Worn out. Emotionally what? Wrung out. And spiritually what? Wiped out. And God says, here is my solution. Because the follow-up lesson to this one is, is rest and sleep. So the best thing that can happen to you when you're stressed out is go to bed. Get some sleep. Get some, come on now, it's right here. In this, what did, here, he, he, you just got through telling me. What, what position is Elijah in? He is physically what? Worn out. He is emotionally what? And he is spiritually wiped out. And God says, okay, boy, get something to eat and go to bed. And when he woke up, the Lord says, okay, you got a long ways to go. When he went to sleep, when he got something to eat to nourish his body, he went 40 days journey on that meat. 